Good morning to everyone. Good morning on this awesome sunny morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I love that word. And we shall rejoice in it and be glad. I want to welcome you to this special Sunday school class that is empowering the African American woman in ecclesiastical leadership. And I don't want to forget those that will be coming on or joining us in a repost later or when some of you will be doing a watch party. And I encourage you to share this. You can go ahead and share this now. Um, or you can begin to start a watch party. Because I think it's some um, information, definitely, that the African-American woman in ecclesiastical leadership definitely does need to know. And if you would like the PowerPoint from this class, you can email me at kmdawkinstyson at gmail.com. And I'll send it to you. Once again, you can email me at kmdawkinstyson at gmail.com and I will send it to you. I want to define as we're going in, we're in this special session. We're in this special session of leading and healing through brokenness. And I am glad um, that you have accepted me as um, a developer as you are going through this process in um, whatever leadership that you are in as an African-American woman. I want to take this time to share with you again, just to remind you, because we've been dealing in this session for a little bit, and every time it's been something new. And I don't ever think that we can um, finish talking about um, the development of the African-American woman in ecclesiastical leadership, because it goes um, beyond just the church, and it goes into our corporate world. And the reason why I say that is because what I shared some time ago, and that is the belief system that we have for our lives is should be the same belief system no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. We stand for the same so that people understand that um, no matter where I am, if I declare unto you that I cannot do this, I'm not going to do this because that is my belief system. But let us define what we mean when we talk about women in leadership. I want you to bear with me because I'm looking all over the place, all of these systems that are in front of me. So I want to make sure that we get this. So when we talk about women in leadership, we're talking about women being used as a representative of God in the church surfaces as either a preacher, a teacher, an administrator, and when we're talking about an administrator, we're talking about supervising the day-to-day -day operations of the church. A one that administers the sacraments of baptism, of communion, of matrimony, someone that is ordained or officially appointed as a senior pastor, and ultimately designated a bishop or overseer. So before we get to where we're going today, and I'm going to share with you what the topic is going to be or what the topic is, let's do a little bit of a review. Um, one of the things I want to review with you is the Ten Commandments for the African-American woman in ministry. One thing, number one, and remember I shared with you if you'd like this PowerPoint, because this PowerPoint will also uh, share with you if you um, are not able to write it down now. It's a little quick for you. But number one, thou shalt be prepared. Number two, thou shalt be a team player. These are the Ten Commandments for African American women in ministry. Number three, thou shalt network. Number four, thou shalt be accountable. Number five, thou shalt empower others. Number six, thou shalt use sound management principles and techniques. Number seven, Thou shalt be committed to the servant leadership style of management exemplified by Jesus Christ. Number eight, thou shalt pursue continuing education and personal development in order to provide quality leadership. I can expand on each one of these, but it will take up our time in moving forward, and I don't want to do that. Number nine, thou shalt develop, pursue, and establish a Bible-centered ethic and ethos in all areas of ministry. And number 10, thou shalt be accessible to Christ 
and to those you are called to serve. Now, I want to remind you of this PowerPoint or this point, and that is real leadership is seeing the future better than the present. Is seeing the future better than the present. Let me remind you of this point also, and that is everyone is a leader in their functioning, in their place of functioning. So then let me share this with you. Just because an individual is in janitorial um, in, in the church, or just because an individual is an usher um, in the church, or just because an individual is what we call uh, Levitical services, and uh, that is one that is assisting those in ministry and uh, visitors and things like that, just because that is your call of God does not mean that you're not a leader. You are a leader. Everyone is a leader in their own functioning. I want you to turn to the book of Habakkuk, a book, the book of Habakkuk, chapter two and verse three. Habakkuk chapter two and verse three. And it says this, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now, what that passage of scripture is speaking to, and that is that the vision, the vision of God, even the vision of your own life, of who you have been called to do, uh, called to be, um, what you have been called to accomplish, it is yet for an appointed time. And in this time that you are waiting for it to be manifested, God is speaking. God is doing something in your life. It will come to pass. But the point of the matter is that you have to wait on God. Sometimes we can run ahead of God. And when we run ahead of God, then we make a whole lot of mistakes that we have to live through in our lives because we didn't wait on God. So what's my point? My subject today that I want to talk to you about is hidden figures in plain sight. Hidden figures in plain sight. I want to focus on healing and closing the door of the past. Healing and closing the door of the past. Um, not too long ago, there was a, a true story, a, a true movie out, and it was entitled Hidden Figures hidden figures. And if you haven't seen the story um, I, about these three African-American mathematicians, I encourage you to see it. These are three African-American mathematicians. They were women at Nassau by the name of Katherine Johnson, Dorothy Vaughn, and Mary Jackson. These three African-American women were the brains behind one of the greatest operations in history. They were behind the launch of astronaut John Glenn into orbit, and this movie was released in 2017. Again, I must say that it is a must-see. These three extraordinary African-American women's lives that were overshadowed by the accomplishments of their Caucasian male colleagues were necessary, but did not get the praise, did not get the attention that they should have. Once again, their accomplish accomplishments were overshadowed by Caucasian male colleagues but they overcame obstacles in order to succeed. They knew who they were and they knew the ability that they had. They were overlooked and they were taken for granted. Follow me. These hidden figures were in the shadows of men. Now, when we take a look at these hidden figures, these three women, African-American women, there are women just in our recent um, that we can also consider to be hidden figures in plain sight. 
There is a woman that I'm very fond of by the name of Bishop Vashti McKenzie. Uh, Bishop Vashti McKenzie is the first woman to pastor at the church called Payne Memorial African Methodist Episcopal Church in Baltimore, Maryland. And on July the 11th, 2000, the AME Church elected her its first female bishop in its 213, now more, 213 year history. It was 213 years by the time that she was elected um, to be the first female bishop. This AME church was promised to never be the same. So Dr. McKenzie, Dr. McKenzie addressed some women on her election. And she said this, watch this. She said, I stand here tonight on the shoulders of the unordained women who serve without affirmation or appointment. I don't stand here alone. She said, but there was a cloud of witnesses who sacrificed, died, and gave their best. As Bishop of the 18th Episcopal District, Dr. McKenzie started orphanages, parental support systems for children who lost their parents to devastating AIDS epidemics in Botswana and Mozambique. And during an interview after her election, Dr. McKenzie explained her view on this topic. She said, instead of placing my gender in front of me, I'll place who I am and what I do and who I serve in front of me. She said, they know I'm a woman. They know I'm a woman when I walk in the door. So what? I have been one all of my life. And she says, get over it. <laughs> the getting over it is a going beyond that a seizing of new territory in being a witness for God. I want you to follow this. She said, and this is very important, women of God, we don't need to be an imitation of men to achieve God's victories, to hide or take on masculine attributes to be accepted by peers and congregations is a compromise to God's call. I'm going to say that again. To hide or take on masculine attributes to be accepted by peers and congregations is a compromise to God's call. One cannot help or validate others until self-evaluation is constituted. Hear this. She said, thou shalt not be intimidated. This is one of Bishop Vashti McKenzie's second commandment. Intimidation stunts growth through elements of fear. And we can really deal with that. Fear and self-doubt, and has been a weapon against female preachers for centuries. To complete God-given assignments, fear of others cannot be a consideration. Hmm. One's call will be questioned at some point, but assurance comes, <coughs> excuse me, comes with believing that God has appointed you. It is important that women do a personal exegesis of especially those texts that are often used against women in ministry. Some choose to ignore and disregard Paul's texts, which have been interpreted as a denouncement of women in church leadership. She says such avoidance leaves women clergy unprepared for opposition and could be a fatal blow to self-esteem, which ultimately undermines an effective ministry. Building relationships with fellow clergy can guard against such behavior because there is strength in unity. Brothers must be included. Women must realize that every man Hear this, women, women of God, women in leadership. Women must realize that every man is not against female clergy. Every man is not against female, flirt, flirt, female clergy. 
forming alliances with male clergy creates more unity within the body of Christ, which yields more power to do things that God requires. Let's move further. I want you to note a woman by the name of Aksa. Aksa. I'm going to spell that. She's in the Bible. Aksa. A-C-H-S-A-H. A-C-H-S-A-H. I want you to see for today, second, uh, um, I'm sorry, in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 15, beginning at verse 16. I want you to see, before we move further in our lesson, I want you to see purposely, I want you to see two hidden figures in the Old Testament. The first one is by the name of Aksa. And Aksa means bursting the veil, bursting the veil. Let's read, if you have it, Joshua chapter 15, verse 16 through 19. And it says this, and Caleb said, he that smiteth Kerjath Sefer and taketh it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. Now, this is the same Caleb that was a positive spy along with Joshua. In the Old Testament times, follow this. In the Old Testament times, marriages were seen as much more than an alliance between a husband and a wife. They were an alliance between two families and often made for political and financial reasons rather than for reasons of affection. Now, Jewish tradition claims that Aksa, Aksa was unbelievably beautiful. Watch this. Unbelievable, unbelievably beautiful. So much so that most of the Jewish women were jealous of her. That worked in her favor. Watch this. It worked in her favor and it worked in her father's favor in destroying a certain enemy. Look at verse 17 of Joshua chapter 15. And Othniel, the son of Kenes, the brother of Caleb, took it and he gave him, he took on the task of defeating the enemy. And after he took on the task of defeating the enemy, Caleb gave his daughter, his beautiful daughter, Aksa to Othniel to be his wife. Now look at verse 18. It came to pass as she came unto him, Othniel, that she moved him to ask her father a field. Ask her father for a field. Now follow this. Caleb gives her, Caleb gives his daughter a piece of land, which made her a realtor. But not only made her a realtor, follow this, she was not only a realtor, but she was a businesswoman. Uh, at a later date, I'm going to be bringing a corporate executive to talk to us, to interview with us, to talk to the African-American woman in ecclesiastical leadership, to speak with us about our finances and increasing our finances because as God begins to use you and as God begins to open the doors for you, no matter what leadership field that you're in, it's necessary for us to understand finances and what to do with finances. It does us a disservice to be effective everywhere else except for in our finances. We can't save a dime. We've got to understand that everything that we see is not necessary to buy. And truly, we understand if we've been through this pandemic and there's a whole lot of things that we would have bought that we didn't buy by now and we have not missed it, it tells us that there's a whole lot of things that are not a need, but they are a want. Now, let me get back to Aksa. Tradition says that land goes to the man or goes to the husband. So the land actually would have gone to Othniel. The land that um, Aksa wanted should have gone to her husband. The only thing that should have gone to her by tradition was jewelry or money. But in Judges chapter 1 and verse 15, it shares that Aksa wanted a gift for herself 
from her dad. Now that's a bold woman. But be, and because that God, uh, because that Caleb loved his daughter, Caleb gave her that land. Now, what land he gave her was called the Negev, N E G E V. The Negev means dry. Follow this. The Negev was considered a desert because of its small quantities of rain. In other words, Aksa was given dry land. She was given dry land. But did that, did that discourage Aksa? No. The Bible says, as we continue in that same verse, the Bible says, and she lighted off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, what wouldest thou? Verse 19, who answered? And this is Aksa answering, give me a blessing. For thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. In other words, it appears that she goes back to her dad. But she goes back to her dad in a respectful manner. That respectful manner is her getting down off of what we call get down off of your high horse. He gave you something. Now, don't be disrespectful. She got down, the Bible says, off of her ass and asked for, now that you gave me this land, I need some water. I need life source for the land. I don't have a problem with tilling the ground. I don't have a problem with working with it. But I'm asking you if you'll give me water to go with it. The Bible says, and he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Now, Caleb gave her all the sources from, from the north and from the south. That is the upper and the lower springs. Now, symbolically, what does that mean? Symbolically, it is declared that um, she received heavenly blessings and earthly blessings. Heavenly blessings and earthly blessings. This woman knew that in her culture, she didn't have a right to anything, but dared to recognize not only what she deserved and then ask for it, but she recognized that there was value in her, in her personage, value that also helped somebody else. In other words, she knew what was physically a value she realized what was physically a value to her father and what Athnia wanted so she realized there was greatness in her figure in her potential of who she was i'm gonna say to you we have a tendency especially as african-american women i think as women period we have a tendency to look on others and see their shapes and see their uh, their form, and we 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 get overly um, overly bothered, and we try to run ourselves uh, four or five hours a day trying to become something. Try, and I want to share with you this, and that is there is value, and I'm going I'm getting ready to release somebody right now. I'm getting ready to free you right now. I'm getting ready to free you right now, right now, right now. There is value in who you are right now. Now, am I saying um, if your health is challenged not to do anything about it? No, I'm not. But what I am saying is sometimes we push ourselves overly and uh, we become a, uh, a, a, a detriment to our own selves. Aksa realized who she was and realized the potential that she had in herself. And she used that to, um, to favor. Now, let me say this. She dared to ask based upon her knowledge of her own value. Not just the value of a personage, but she knew what she could do if she was entrusted with a thing. And her father knew what she can do. So her father entrusted her and God knows what you will do with what he gives to you. Now you can prove him, prove him right. Or you can say, God, I changed my mind and I'm not going to do much with this. Mm. Listen, if you're going to dare to ask God for something or even more, be ready to till it. 
be ready to work it. Till the ground through good times and through bad times. No more excuses. Be ready to turn what you have into greater. She asked for more, to do more, to increase more. Do you remember this statement? Leadership is your ability to take what is given to you and move it forward. Remember, if you're not taking what you have been given and moving it forward, Bishop Jake said, you're babysitting it. You are a leader because you moved it forward and not because of your title. It's not about your title, but it's about what's within you. Now, here I want you to see one more hidden figure in the Bible. Hidden figures in plain sight. Watch this. I'm going somewhere. You got to stay with me. Stay with me. This is a woman by the name of Shira. Shira is S-H-E-R-A-H and sometimes spelled with two E's. S-H-E-E-R-A-H. Shira means kinswoman. Kinswoman. Turn to the book of 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 24. 1 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 24. I'm getting ready to move forward because we want to get together in, in service time. Uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 24. And it says, and his daughter was Shira. That's Ephraim. His daughter was Shira who built Beth Haran, the nether, and the upper, Azin Shira. She built Beth Haran, the nether, and the upper, and Uzin Shira. Now, she was the granddaughter of Joseph. The favor was upon the generation, whether male or female. Watch this. God was prophesying concerning his hand being upon sons and daughters before Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. That's the passage that we always pull out when we talk about the favor being on the daughters also. But the favor we can see was on the daughters through Shira. Shira was mentioned in the genealogy. Now it's where very few women are named in genealogies because at that time the family line was traced through the men. But we see this woman, Shira, noted in the genealogy. So it's significant when a woman is mentioned and even named in one. Shira was influential, Shira was wealthy. God entrusted Shira with a vision strategically and strength uh, not only with vision but with strategy and with strength to build and establish the towns of upper haran and lower haran it was located in the hill country of ephraim watch this she built i'm not talking about spiritually she built not one not two but three cities. How often have you heard about Shira in the Bible as a contractor? Come on, come on here. Come on, come on. She built three cities. This is the only woman in the Old Testament that is mentioned to building cities. She was a constructor. She was a contractor and she was a master builder. She was Shira. These towns were built in a strategic location. Shira even built a town that bears her name, Uzzin Shira. Listen, someone shared a book that they read entitled How to Lead When You're Not in Charge by Clay Scroggins. Clay, C-L-A-Y Scroggins, S-C-R-O-G-G-I-N-S. And I encourage you, if you are able to, to purchase that book and read it, I encourage you to do that. How to lead when you're not in charge. Sometimes there's a feeling that if I'm not in front or in charge, I cannot lead. Watch this. These women were leading before anyone was even following them. Remember this point. How well do you lead when no one is watching you? How well do you lead when nobody gives you a title? 
How well do you lead when nobody puts you in front? How well do you lead when nobody puts a group of people in front of you? I believe that leadership is more so lifestyle than a calling. I'm going to say that again. I believe that leadership is more so a lifestyle than a calling. There's a man by the name of John Ramsey. Or I'm sorry, not John Ramsey, David Ramsey. David Ramsey is a best-selling author and nationally syndicated radio show host. He says this, people don't follow titles. You get that? They follow courage and integrity. That means true leadership or true leaders become people of influence, regardless of their spot on an organizational chart. So what does these women's lives say to us? about hidden, hidden figures. So why are we talking about hidden figures? Why are we talking about hidden women in plain sight or hidden figures in plain sight? Because you may have a concern and may be troubled because of the fact you've been over here with all of these talents and gifts for a long time and ain't nobody called you to do nothing. You said, ain't nobody asked me to do nothing. Don't nobody see me. I want to say to you this, and that is God sees you and he has not forgotten about you. God hid these women in a place where he, where we wouldn't notice them in our faces to give them a moment to address who they are while allowing others to have you in the forefront of their minds. In other words, God allows you and him to work on you while you're in their face so they won't forget you. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of Joseph. It reminds me of Joseph because Joseph, the Bible says, when he was thrown into the pit, he was thrown into the pit and he was there with uh, uh, the, 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 um, the baker and, and the butcher and, and, and all of these. And the Bible says that when he began to speak with them and begin to share with them what their dream meant, when they were released out of the pit, uh, when they were released out of prison, they were supposed to tell, uh, 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 they were supposed to tell those in charge, look, who gave this, who interpreted this was a man that's down there in prison. But they forgot. But at the time that God wanted him, the time that God wanted Joseph to be, be remembered, they said, oh yeah. But had Joseph not been in their face before, they wouldn't have remembered. But it is you in their face when nobody quote unquote sees the gift and talent that you have god is getting ready to use you when god hides you for a time he is preparing you for a greater i'm gonna say that again when god hides you for a time he is preparing you for a greater i want you to turn real quickly with me to esther chapter 2 and let's begin at verse 5 Esther chapter 2 and beginning at verse 5. And I'm going to uh, uh, quickly wrap this up. Or as quickly as I can. <laughs> Esther chapter 2 beginning at verse 5. Now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jer, the son of Shemia, the son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem with, cap, with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. Verse 7. And he brought up Hadassah, which is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful. Here we have another beautiful woman. Uh, her beauty again is opening door for her. You are beautiful. Mm, 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 mm. I need to tell somebody because you're thinking, oh, I, I, I'm not all that. I'm not all that. Yes, you are. You are beautiful. 
Uh, somebody said beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And it is. God is going to open doors for you based upon you, not based upon somebody else. Not based upon somebody, what somebody else looks like, but what you are. Hmm. For she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful. Whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. Verse 7. So it came to pass when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, watch this, to the custody of Haggai, that Esther was brought also unto the king's house to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. Hester, Esther was brought into the same room, the same atmosphere with all the other women that were competing for the king. Verse 9, and the maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her her things for purification. Remember, y'all, she was not getting ready to go directly to the king now, but she was in preparation. She was a hidden figure. What was she doing during this time? She was being prepared speedily gave her things of purification with such things as belonged to her and gave her seven maidens which were meet to be given her out of the king's house and he preferred her and her maids unto the best place of the house of the women listen here is esther full of giftings but full of giftings does not mean run right now what does the Bible declare in the book of Matthew, chapter 22 and verse 14? It says, for many are called. Yeah, you got that right. For many are called, but few are chosen. It may be your calling. But God has a time of preparation. Don't run yet. Look at verse 10. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred. She was a hidden figure. For Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. Verse 12. Now when every maid's turn was come to go in to King Ahasuerus, after that she had been 12 months. It's a whole year. Some of y'all said, I ain't waiting for no God call me right now. I'm getting ready to run. I'm supposed to be in this leadership position. I'm getting ready to do it right now. I heard somebody say, check yourself before you wreck yourself. You could wreck yourself before you even get out there. Twelve months according to the manner of the women. For so were the days of their purifications accomplished to wit, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors and with other things for the purifying of the of the women six months for this and six months for that verse 13 then thus came every maiden unto the king whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house verse 14 in the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women, to the custody of Shagaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubine, concubines. She came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Verse 15, now when the turn of Esther, here's her turn. Oh, remember this, hidden figures, there will be your turn. When it is your turn, it will be your time. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Ab Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king. She required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. 
God will grant favor when it's your time and when it's your turn. But running without time and without turn can turn individuals against you, even though you may declare, I got everything that they need. Verse 16, so Esther was taken unto King Ahasuerus into his house royal in the 10th month, which is the month to Beth in the seventh year of his reign. Verse 17, final verse. And the king loved Esther above all women, and she obtained favor, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. God hid Esther in the woman's quarters among other beautiful women on purpose for purpose. Watch this. Her beauty was amongst other beauties. But her beauty was noticed because her beauty was in the right time. Hmm. In every life, there is a moment when God will reveal what is hidden. Listen, Esther had 12 months plus to work on herself. She lived amongst those that were, quote unquote, her competitors. And she did not come out with their spirits. She remained among them, but not of them. Can you be among them that are competing and remain yourself? Be who you are. Let's talk a little bit about the hidden figure challenges. Then we're going to close. I want to talk about emotional paralysis and closing the door to past hurt. What is going to keep you from becoming. The biggest immobilizer that paralyzes is fear. Fear of not being accepted, fear of disapproval, fear of taking a stand, and fear of change. In John chapter 5, Jesus sees a man laying at the pool of Bethesda waiting for the water to be troubled again. Like waiting your turn to run into a double dutch uh, a, a rope. He was waiting on somebody to put him in the game when the water is troubled. He waited on somebody. Hear this. He waited on somebody for 38 years. We would say by now, he could have inchwormed himself into the water within 38 years. If he was that slow, he could have inched himself straight on into the water. But here is what you don't understand. Mental and emotional paralysis of the mind will tell the physical man a whole lot of reasons why it isn't a good idea to move without people giving you the approval. Jesus, that was a mouthful. His mind had limitations. His mind set limitations on his whole body, on his life. Jesus asked him, and he asked you, and he asked me a question. Are you willing to go for this change for yourself? Are you willing to do this? Stop using excuses about other people. Are you willing to change? Jesus asked the man if he wanted to change. All you got to declare is I want to change. And when you declare within yourself, I want to change, then the change is happening. When all you know is what you have to do, and wh or what you have done and where you have been, it will paralyze you to the present and hinder your future. 
when all you know is what you have done and where you have been, it will paralyze you to the present and hinder your future. I want you to know this, that there is a cost to change. Making any change means giving up something that is familiar, even though it may seem to be detrimental to you. People will change. Hear me. New responsibilities will come. Attention and sympathy will be no more. Expectations will be greater when you change. Change is not easy, but the question is, are you ready to change? Are you ready to change where you are at the moment that you are hidden? So when God opens the door, you can run. Paralysis comes in the forms of overly being compliant, constantly giving in to people to avoid hearing a difference of opinion, to avoid conversations that may be uncomfortable to you. Here is a need to address your own insecurities, your own self-doubt. That will be to your detriment in leadership. Trying to be secure in what you in yourself while trying to work with people. People will throw jabs all the time. Paralysis comes in the form of constant seeking of approval. Not convinced of your own self-worth. Convinced that if you say what other wants you to hear, you can be accepted. We must be under authority, but submit with the intent this will gain approval if it is emotional paralysis. Getting high on the admiration of others results in emotional drunkenness. That's said by a man by the name of Dr. William Noss. When you feel a strong need for approval, you tend to become a pawn of your own urgency. Listen, paralysis comes in the form of being the good girl, passing out favors, with me, passing out favors to everybody while inwardly resenting the one you are doing favors for or even resenting yourself for doing the favor. Listen, this can only be only come about because you allow it. Paralysis comes in the form of expecting to be rejected. This is your own evaluation of yourself that you reject or that you reflect on to others. Watch this. People don't people you don't give people permission to see you the way you see you. People can feel how you see you. Don't underestimate people's perceptions and give them allowance to see you the way you see you. The question is, wilt thou be made whole? Change your own narrative. Practice seeing yourself the way God sees you and the way you want to see you. Change. Practice the opposite. Close the door to the past. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 and 19 says, Remember ye not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Closing the door to the past is not easy, but you must be willing to what? Number one, forgive yourself. Number two, forgive others. The problem is that letting go is difficult. And often we lack the courage to leave what has given us comfort down through the years. But leaving is entering into new realms and opportunities. Do like the woman with the issue of blood. Make a demand upon God's ability to deal with issues. Get tired of where you are and take up your own bed and walk. I'm going to say that again. Take up your bed, your own bed and walk. You're standing now in the anointing of a new day. I need somebody to put that in the comment box. 
And I pray you have been teaching right along with me all through this. And for those that are doing replay, come on, I need you to teach along with me. Put this in the comment box. You're standing now in the anointing of a new day. Take the doorstop out of yesterday because you're not going back. Close it completely and seal it with a praise. I pray something has been said that will encourage you, that will help you move forward in what God has called you to do and to be. Before we leave off this feed, you have the opportunity to sow into the ministry of Calvary Ministries International and or Christ Church Apostolic. Both are good ground. Sowing into Calvary Ministry International, you can go to the cash app, dollar sign, Mount Calvary, or you can go to GiveLify or PayPal to Mount Calvary Pentecostal Church, or you can mail it in to Mount Calvary Pentecostal Church, 1812 Oak Hill Avenue, Youngstown, Ohio, or Christ Church Apostolic. You can go to www.ccand.org, or you can go to the Christ Church Cash app, or Christ Church app, or you can mail it in to Christ Church Apostolic, 6601 Grandview Drive, Indianapolis, Indiana. I pray that you sow into this ministry and may God bless you and may God keep you. And I want you to keep your eyes and your ears open because empowering the African-American woman in ecclesiastical leadership is coming back to you with a great interview that you won't want to miss and other interesting things. God bless you and keep you in Jesus name.